The world, despite its disasters, tragedies, and villainies, cannot end unless it runs out of stories. Whenever the end seems near, the beginning is also close at hand. The mystics know that, but so do the nuclear physicists. At the mystical, mythical, and metaphysical levels of life, the world is ending and beginning every moment. The next world is right next to this world, and the two intersect in little moments of redemption and recreation. Most religious visions of the end times predict a renewal of the world, but only after a divine intervention first destroys the world as we know it. In many ways, the world as we knew it has already ended, and we are already standing on the threshold of the next world. Page 20. Everybody. Welcome back to my channel. It's me, Rachel, the student witch. I hope you and your loved ones are safe and doing well. Um, I am here to give my thoughts, share my thoughts and opinions about um, this book, which I finished probably a little over a week ago or so. Um, it seems pertinent. Um, this is Why the World Doesn't End, Tales of Renewal in Times of Loss by Michael Mead. And just look at that cover art. And what I love about this book, or one of the things I love about it, is actually um, in the front cover, there's a blurb here actually describing the... Um, the painting and giving the name of the painter, Vladimir Kush. Um, and it's a painting of the world egg or the, the cosmic egg image. And so we are in the middle of a global pandemic. As of today, at the time of this recording, there are over 3 million cases worldwide with over 200,000 dead. And yeah. Um, I think it's a good time for me to share my thoughts about this book and um, it took me a long time to read it because I kept reading a chapter or two and then setting it down, letting a few months go by and rinse, repeat, right? Um, but I, I actually read the last three or four chapters um, while in quarantine and that, that really has affected my impressions of the book and my thoughts about the book and um, my my thoughts on the ideas he presents in this book. So um, I started off with that quote from page 20 to kind of give you an idea about what this book is all about, which in a nutshell, in my own words, to paraphrase or to kind of uh, oversimplify things, <laughs> probably, um, this book is about the healing power of myth, essentially. And it specifically focuses on myths of end times, myths of destruction, but also myths of creation or recreation. And um, it, he, Michael Mead, talks about myths from all over the world. And I'll get into that um, here in a minute. Um, myths of destruction and creation. Uh, and each chapter focuses on, loosely focuses on a specific myth or a specific couple of myths. And he kind of zooms in on that myth and then expounds upon it. Um, Michael Mead, now I'd never heard of him before picking up this book. I, um, just a quick little story about how this book came into my possession. Um, at the time I was still living in Georgia in the United States. I now live in Santiago, Chile. <laughs> and um, we were in Atlanta, my partner and I, uh, getting paperwork done and preparing documents that we needed for my immigration here in Chile, like um, getting certified copies and notaries, signing documents and all sorts of stuff. Well, while in Atlanta, um, we had one last visit to the Phoenix and Dragon bookstore 
which I highly recommend. I know the shops and stuff are closed, although Georgia is starting to open things up. Um, oh, anyway, <laughs> do not agree with the governor of Georgia. Um, anyway, I know the store might be closed, but they might be selling things online. I don't know. I'll include their website down below. It's a really great um, kind of metaphysical shop that I love to support when I was still living in Georgia. But anyway, I stopped by there for one last time before we left the U.S. And um, this book was, and I still have the sticker on the back, 50% off. And just going on the title, Why the World Doesn't End, I was immediately pulled to it. Um, in case you don't know, I am currently writing my dissertation. I'm in a kind of literature program, um, and my dissertation has to do with the apocalypse. <laughs> um, not specifically the biblical or Christian apocalypse, but more apocalypse as metaphor, apocalypse as myth, apoc apocalypse as uh, a place from which to theorize about things like colonialism and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I, I've been drawn to the idea of apocalypse um, and apocalyptic imagery, apocalyptic, you know, dystopian fiction, like anything having to do with the apocalypse or the end times, endings and beginning times, right? Um, for years, for years and years. Um, and so, I, I couldn't resist, even though I, ha I knew nothing about the author, I knew nothing about who he was or what he did, but it just sounded interesting and it was 50% off and so I bought it. And now we're talking about probably back in March or April of 2019, we moved here to Santiago in June 2019 and I actually started reading this book um, while I was on the airplane coming down here. <laughs> Um, because the past six to nine months since we've left the United States and moved here, it's just been like, it's, it seems like it's been one apocalyptic moment after another. Um, you know, just moving abroad, and I'll include a, a video talking more about that and why we had to do that uh, in the corner up here. Um, that in and of itself felt like a dying and a rebirth process and then in October Chile um, experienced a um, what they call estadio social, just a social revolution, a political crisis, a very major political crisis which the country is still grappling with and I made a video about that sharing my thoughts um, back in October about that, which I'll link up here. And now this, a, a pandemic. And so it's just boom, boom, boom. Like it's, it's been an intense year, y'all, <laughs> uh, for a lot of people. Um, so I started reading this, just beginning my journey of living here. And I finished this in the middle of a pandemic. And I, can honestly say it's um, it's helped me to kind of go back to my roots. I know a lot of us around the world right now, um, we're spending time in quarantine or under stay-at-home orders or social distancing from people. We're spending more time on our own. It's It feels like one big, huge, global kind of hermit card moment, like the hermit card from the tarot. And so that's kind of prompted a lot of introspection and reevaluating of things and people. Um, I've noticed a lot of people talking about it, a lot of people I know, people I watch on, you know, in the community on YouTube. Um, and I definitely have been experiencing that myself. I actually have done whew, so much shadow work. I had so many um, things. I've, I've just, it's been just an emotional roller coaster, and it's, it's required a lot of um, reflection and a lot of processing, emotional processing, which can be just physically exhausting. 
Um, I know I, my body and my mind and my spirit has been kind of in an introspection, slow down. Give yourself time to think, feel, and process everything that's going on. Um, that, that's been my state of mind uh, for a long time. Um, well, since this really started exploding uh, in March. So, um, we're all kind of in, in this state of self-reflection and reevaluating our relationships or things in life and seeing things under new light. And a lot of that has to do with going into the darkness. Um, and actually, I kind of want to read another quote from this book, just a short section of a paragraph toward the end about the importance about entering into and learning from the darkness. Um, so this is on page 220, which is in the, I think, the last chapter of this book, and I've highlighted it here. Um, because this kind of summarizes well the gist of this book, too, before I keep rambling for too much longer. Uh, he says, unlike ideas that suggest that enlightenment might be found by imagining figures of light, the old stories and teaching tales prefer the kind of knowledge and quality of healing that comes from visiting the darkness. Notice how going to the edge and facing the dark, darkest places can lead to both individual as well as collective awakening. Ways to bring healing to the great conflicts and troubles that currently threaten the world might elude people unless we learn to face the darkness of the situation. There are similarities between running towards the roar, entering into the ashes, and accepting the presence of the black dog of chaos. And there he's, he's alluding to previous chapters and previous myths that he covered in those chapters. All stories attempt some kind of healing or revelation of essential knowledge. All depend upon the presence of trouble and a willingness to enter the unknown." End quote. <laughs> this idea of entering the darkness um, you know, like I said earlier, my, a lot of my research has to do with apocalypse and belief in apocalypse and how that affects people's behavior or apocalypse as um, represented in art, apocalypse represented in colonial writing and literature, right? And um, apocalypse literally means revelation, right? And revelation, it's not just the title of the last book of the Bible, right? It's um, it, the way that I'm interpreting it and the way that um, this, this coronavirus, COVID-19 situation, it's, um, it's staring into and acknowledging the darkness, right? The darkest places where our ego and our fears don't want us to go, don't want us to acknowledge, right? And in the darkness, you actually find a new source of light. And um, the imagery of light in the darkness for me is uh, the light of truth. And sometimes it's a cold, hard truth. Other times it can be a sense of enlightenment or an uplifting spiritual kind of truth. But whatever it is, it's truth with a capital T, right? And now I don't want to romanticize like going into the darkness. I know, um, you know, as somebody who has experienced on and off throughout my life depression and anxiety, I, I definitely don't want to kind of romanticize the idea of like letting yourself go into the dark, dark places within yourself, right? Um, it's more of a, an acknowledgement because I know for, for me, I, for example, just in the last few weeks, I, I caught myself um, kind of in the throes of another wave of depression. And I know I'm not alone in this, right? Um, so I don't want to, it's not losing yourself to that. It's more of um, a willingness to enter the unknown. It's a willingness to acknowledge the situation right? It's a willingness to acknowledge the truth of the situation. And the truth of the situation is there are over 
there are tens and tens and tens of thousands of people who are dead. And the truth of the situation is, um, you know, the future, how we respond to this and the lessons that we're going to learn from this, all of that is yet to be, you know, um, it's yet to be fully realized. Um, you know, on my more hopeful days, I think that this could be um, a time of immense change, necessary changes when it comes to like public health and public education, international relations. And it could be an opportunity to bring more justice to more people in this world. However, it's also a situation that could quickly turn into um, just yet another wave of more, uh, you know, authoritarianism, <laughs> you know. Um, more confusion and more violence, right? It's, I think this, this experience too has caused a lot of us to face death, um, in, in new and different ways, perhaps. Um, the reality of our own death, which is hard for the ego to accept, right? The deaths of others. Um, just in my personal life here, back in April, around mid-April, um, on a Tuesday in mid-April, a close friend of mine lost her father to cancer. And then later that same week, my partner's grandfather died of a stroke. Um, and here in the Southern Hemisphere, we're, the end of April is Samhain, and it's the season of death. We're approaching and entering into winter. You know, I have my cardigan on for a reason, right? Um, it's, you know, there, there's just that imagery of darkness and finding the light of truth of kind of objective truth, if such a thing is possible <laughs> through subjective gnosis, right? That fun little paradox, right? Um, that is what I've taken out of this experience and that those are the kind of revelations that come from facing the darkness instead of running away from it, instead of being in denial about it, instead of losing your shit because of it, right? Um, and so I, I think this book is incredibly pertinent to these times. And I love how he, he goes back and talks about myth and the importance of myth, the timelessness of myth and why myth is important. Um, uh, I think it's on page 18. He talks about myth. Um, myths are not things of the past, but rather the eternal, ongoing stories that point to the underlying truths and essential meanings of creation. And so, I this has kind of reawakened within me a desire to learn more and more about myths from around the globe. Um, so this book, if you're interested in that, in finding the... Um, the timeless truths and a sense of empowerment and spiritual like learning and growth through facing the darkness. Um, reading up about creation and destruction myths, like myths about the beginning of time but also the end of time from different cultures around the world might be a great place to start. And um, he kind of summarizes a lot of these folk tales and myths throughout this book and every single chapter of this book. It just goes over, well, this book came out in 2012, I believe. Let me double check that. Let me see. 2012. And so he does talk about, you know, um, pollution and climate change in terms of the more like social level of things. Because he connects the mythic to the personal, to personal development. He does incorporate a lot of like psychoanalysis. And if you're familiar with Joseph Campbell, um, or works along those lines, this is going to definitely um, be familiar to you, the way that this author talks about myth. 
Um, but he also connects it to the social. And right now with the global pandemic, it's, you know, we're being asked, what are the lessons we're going to take out of this experience? And how are we going to use those lessons to continue to shape our world, um, our ourselves and our world, right? That's what we are being asked to do in this experience. Um, and um, a lot of the stories told in this book um, kind of remind us that there's hope, right? Change and destruction can also give way to hope, to, uh, to more justice to more people, or at least that's my hope for our current reality. Um, those are the kind of revelations that come through with Apocalypse. And so, um, the one thing that I didn't really like, just to wrap up my thoughts about this book, the one thing I didn't really like was some of the stories and myths. He wasn't very specific about the specific, you know, society or culture or people that the stories come from. He'll just say, you know, an old South American myth about, of creation, blah, 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 or uh, an old African story says this, and I wish that he was more specific about where those myths came from. Um, in some cases he is, particularly with um, the few kind of um, Hindu myths, I believe, that he touches on. But overall, um, this is a really, fairly well written and put together book. There was one instance where I think the editor didn't catch a mistake. Um, toward the end of the book, in one of the chapters, he kind of accidentally repeated a paragraph or a couple sentences. And I think that's something that the editor didn't catch. Um, but other than that, I think this book is well written. It's well put together. The ideas of it, um, it can simultaneously help you kind of find meaning in this dark, in this darkness, in this time of death that we are witnessing now as a species, um, and also find hope, find that light of truth, and face it, to have the courage to face it, because really what we are witnessing is something that humanity and life on this planet has witnessed over and over and over again. This might be new to us, but this is not new to our story as a species, right? And we can look back to myths to find the strength to get through this. Uh, and this book is a nice little, you know, it's only, let's see, 200 and something pages, 224 pages long. So it's a nice, short and sweet, um, but still like, dense and juicy collection of this author's thoughts in relation to myths and what we can learn from them in times of chaos, in those apocalyptic times when we are being asked to, to witness, to, you know, to see those divine revelations, um, to make changes. So um, I'm going to put information about the author down below. I read up a little bit about him. He seems like a pretty interesting person and he works with an organization, um, an intercultural kind of organization um, that sounds pretty interesting, but honestly, I don't know much about it. I'm willing to kind of read up more about it if I can find information. I'll just, um, before I kind of wrap this up, I'll just read what's on the back of the book here, his little bio here on the back cover. Michael Mead is a renowned storyteller, author, and scholar of mythology, anthropology, and psychology. He combines hypnotic and fiery storytelling, street-savvy perceptiveness, and spellbinding interpretations of ancient myths with a deep knowledge of cross-cultural rituals. Um, he's the founder of the Mosaic Multicultural Foundation and the author of other books, and they list the books here. So this is actually printed by Greenfire Press, which um, is associated with the Mosaic Multicultural Foundation. So I'll leave the, um, the website for the foundation that he founded down below and some information about him if you're interested. But I, um, 
I do recommend this book. I, I actually, I think it would make a great companion to Pregnant Darkness, which I'll link up in the cards a, um, the review that I did of this book not too long ago, I think back in December, um, which if Michael Mead talks about several different myths to talk about facing the darkness, right? This book uses uh, the language and the symbolism of alchemy and inner alchemy to face that pregnant darkness, that, preg that darkness that, yes, it is scary, it might be full of death and destruction, it might be full of chaos, but it also allows for new beginnings and rebirth, right? And that's why it's pregnant with possibility. So I highly uh, recommend checking out this book, and you can start um, with my review, which is linked up here. Um, so this, these two make great kind of companions to each other. And next, actually, the next book that I'm going to be reading that I will share on my channel um, as we are still living and witnessing this um, pandemic is The Seven Life Lessons of Chaos, Spiritual Wisdom from the Science of Change by John Briggs and F. David Peep. This is a book I actually started and I read probably about the first half years ago. I set it down and never finished it, but we are in a time of change, right? And I think this might be a good book to kind of, um, as, a, as a, yet another companion piece to these other two books. So yeah, um, I do recommend this book. I do. I enjoyed it and I learned a lot from it. So, uh, yeah, until next time, many blessings and I hope you are safe and well and um, share your thoughts down below about myths and getting through, like, what are the spiritual practices, what are the myths, what are the you know, deities or, you know, energies that you're working with to get through this. I, I think that would be interesting to see what people are doing. Um, and it might be good to share with others. So, bye y'all. Stay safe.